Thanks, Joseph. Thank you. Good afternoon, to everyone. Let's try again. Good afternoon. Thank you. I'm delighted, honored to be here with you. And Joseph said he's from uh, Kentucky originally. If you can't tell by my accent, I'm not. Uh, I'm from New York, but I'd like to clarify something. I'm from northern New York. There is a difference. Uh, grew up in the Adirondack Mountains, live in northern New York. Eleven kids in my high school graduating class. Not what you think of as a New York high school. And I was in the top ten of my class, just so you know. Okay. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you and share a little information today with you and maybe challenge your assumptions a little bit. As I do that, let me give you a backdrop. As I look at PGES, ladies and gentlemen, somebody asked me out in the hall earlier today, and Joseph happened to be with me when the question was asked, what state in the country seems to be doing the best job in positioning itself for the Common Core State Standards and the new assessments? And I said, there are two and Kentucky was one of them. I, I think you've done a good job in this state of beginning to get ready. I think your uh, PGES really helps you position some things because what you have done far better than I can find anywhere else is you are talking about common core state standards and teacher evaluation in the same breath. And you have to, folks. This is about raising the standards and changing what everybody does in and around the American education system. With that as a backdrop, uh, uh, let me also make this observation, however. Uh, I think you're doing the right thing. And you, you are absolutely focusing on the mechanics of what do you need to do to implement Common Core, the new assessment programs, the new teacher evaluation programs. And throughout, I looked at the program throughout this conference, you're going to get all the details. That's not my job to go into the mechanics. But I, I begin by saying they are essential that you understand them. Mine's a little bit different. Mine's setting the uh, stage. Why are all these things they're going to walk you through so very, very important? Because you really need to begin with the end in mind. Joseph just indicated that there was a study. There was actually a five-year study uh, jointly conducted by the Council of Chief State School Officers. Every state in the country has a state superintendent or a state commissioner. The 50 are called the Council of Chief State School Officers. That group and my group were approached now six years ago by the National Governors Association and a group of corporate leaders. And we were asked to go out across America and try to find the nation's 25 most rapidly improving elementary schools the 25 most rapidly improving middle schools, and the 25 most rapidly improving high schools out of 47,000 school buildings. And I want to underscore something. I didn't say highest performing. I said most rapidly improving. These were schools that five years earlier had been in the bottom 10% of every indicator in their state, now in the top 10%, with the same budget, the same faculty, and the same student population. How did they do it? We found the schools. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was very generous in financially supporting the study. And the results of that study is one of the primary things that led to the Common Core State Standards and the next generation assessments and the new teacher evaluation. Because where did they come from? They didn't come from the U.S. Department of Education. They came from the Council of Chief State School Officers and the National Governors Association. And so, I want to raise a question. What's your mission? Is your mission Common Core? Is that why we're here? Or is the mission the new test? Or is your mission teacher evaluation? See, in the nation's highest performing schools, I want to be very clear about something. This is where they ended up. It's not where they started. And that's what is scary to me. I'm fearful in state after state, school district after school district in this country, we've taken the results of what the nation's most rapidly improving schools did and just tried to lay them on the system. Because what we discovered 
It wasn't even these three. It wasn't even graduation. It wasn't even college admission. Let me try something. I want you to be honest with yourselves and each other. How many in this room have a recent, no, uh, no, have, how many of you have a son or a daughter who is a preteen, a teen, or in their early 20s? Hands way up. Okay, good. How many of you who just raised your hands hope the person you just raised your hands about sometime in the next decade becomes independent? <laughs> How many do not want them to be independent? And I'll show you a very sick person. <laughs> so you want your kids to be independent. Okay, let me ask you a second question. How many in the room know a recent four-year college graduate who is now back home with mommy and her dad made the decision to head off to graduate school because they can't find meaningful employment or are off on their own, but mom and dad are still having to financially support them? How many in the room know somebody like that? Not, not part way up, hands way up high. Put them way up high. Put them way up high. Look around the auditorium, folks. What happened? These are success stories. These are the kids who played by all of our rules. These are the kids that would have knocked the socks off of the Common Core State Standards. What happened? Well, let me ask you a third question. And I want you to be honest with yourselves and each other on this one. How many in this auditorium know a recent four-year college graduate or somebody that graduated many years ago? How many know a person? It could be your son. It could be your daughter. It could be you personally. It could be your grandchild. It could be a child next door. How many in the room know a person with an outstanding college loan? Hands way up. Not part way up, way up high. Please keep them up and look around the room for the few who don't have their hand up. What happened? Folks, what happened is America changed. And forgive me, the American education system didn't change as rapidly. See, the Common Core State Standards say something under them. That the highest performing, most rapidly improving schools in the country clearly, clearly understood. Common Core State Standards are college and what, folks? And you know what everybody hears when they hear college and career ready? They hear college prep or CTE. And I didn't say and, I said or. And college prep is for my child, career and tech ed is for somebody else's kid. Because my kid's going to go to college and return deeply in debt. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Common Core State Standards do not say college or career ready. They do not say college prep or CTE. The problem is that is our paradigm as educators. That's what we hear. Highest performing schools in the country understood something. They understood that culture trumps strategy. And what it, it's what I want to drive home with you today. See, our schools aren't failing. That's American schools. They're getting better. We graduated a higher percentage of 18-year-olds last year than any year in our nation's history. And we did that despite the fact that those kids had more state tests to take and more state standards to cover than ever before. In fact, forgive me. Kentucky has never seen a standard it doesn't like. And when in doubt, put it on the plate. And am I right? We got every teacher on a treadmill that would just keep turning faster and faster and saying, you better cover everything because it might be on the test. Now, I'm not opposed to the standards. I'm for the standards. There's nobody in the room closer to them than I am. I'm just fearful we're starting in the wrong place. And I think the framers of PGES understood that, and I'm going to show that to you. 
how they understood that, but we seem not to be listening to that part. See, our schools are getting better. So why the call for school reform? It's not new. 1983, the nation at risk. Anybody ever hear of it? No child left, be left behind. Ever hear of it? Now common core state standards. Who has been pushing school reform so hard onto all the elected officials in this country for the last 30 years? Is it the kids demanding higher standards? Is it the faculty coming together demanding we be made to do more in different things? No. Who's been putting all the pressure on elected officials to improve our schools? It's business. It's not even higher education. It's business. First step in solving a problem is to define the problem. Why? Because the world outside of school is that line. Pushed by technology. Pushed by globalization. The world outside of school is changing four to five times faster than the rate of change inside of school. And so what happens is every year we get a little bit better, the bottom line. But literally our kids are worse off, the top line. Our kids are the best educated ever and simultaneously the worst off. That's why the call for school reform. Problem is, all those business leaders and elected officials, there's another issue that they do not clearly understand. They think they do, but I don't think they do, and that is this. We have a lot of kids coming to us less and less ready for school. The readiness factor has dropped. As more and more children in America come to us out of poverty, and what we've got is this horrendous gap. And the intent of the Common Core State Standards, next generation assessments, teacher evaluation, is to close the gap. So how do you do it? This is the opening paragraph of the original doc document of PGES. It's the opening paragraph. The next several years are pivotal years for reorienting, reorienting the culture of public education. And then it goes on to say that if we don't do this, there's a lot of people out there who are saying, this too shall pass. Have you heard it? See, our experience has been this. You can break school faculties into thirds. There's a third of the staff that every time somebody like me shows up, they get excited. This group has never heard an idea they do not like. They are in a perpetual state of excitement. They're the lunatic fringe, they are half crazy. How many in the room are classroom teachers? Any? Any teacher that's here, you're here because you're the lunatic fringe. You are the crazy. And they are the ones who become school administrators. How many school administrators do we have with us? You are the wackos, you are the crazies. Then we got another third, see if I'm right, administrators that basically say, maybe to every new idea, who's gonna pay for it? Where am I supposed to get the time? Will it be on the test? Who's gonna train us? Where's the technology? They're not negative, they're realist. And then you got another third that basically say, <laughs> over my dead body. Will you do anything that messes up my 1990 lesson plan? I got this sucker laminated, I'm not about to change it. How many of you can think of somebody like that that you work with? Hands way up. Okay, if they're with you, point to them so I know what ones they are. <laughs> if you go too fast on school reform, the bottom third will say to the middle third, this too shall pass. Everything else has, and if not, we'll get ourselves a new administrator. We'll be here longer than they are. And so folks, what we tried to do is find the nation's most rapidly improving schools. What were the schools that did not look, I'm sorry, like this line, but instead looked like that line? 
or ideally that line. And that's the study that started six years ago. Out of that study was born the Common Core State Standards. But the first thing they did, these schools, is they didn't start six years ago with Common Core. They didn't start with a new teacher evaluation program, and they didn't start with new tests. They were the results of changing a culture. Uh, you have on your table some yellow sheets. As I go through my presentation today, there are sections of this presentation I am going to fly by and basically just tell you what's there. Uh, I'm going to send anybody who wants it, it's what the yellow sheets are for, two things. We will send you next week my PowerPoint from today exactly as you're seeing it. Number two, we will then send you to a website where the PowerPoint slides are actually backed up by notes, which you can then use with your faculty, with your community, in case there's anything I hit that you want to kind of cherry pick. You're also taping it, and George, you're gonna, I assume you're going to make the tape available, right, to the schools. And so what I hope to do is arm you with a lot of stuff you can use back in your local schools to help create this awareness. I will then, after I create the awareness, dig a little bit deeper into, okay, now let's actually look at the Common Core, the new assessments, the teacher evaluation, and let's figure out how they actually implemented them in their schools. But they all began first with creating a culture. We'll stop a couple times during the session, let you uh, talk about some of the things I've said, think about questions, observations. So, what should we be doing? Well, I think you need to look at what th that national study I just referred to of the nation's most rapidly improving schools. I also want you to look at the research. So I'm going to fly by the research so that you'll know where you can go and get it. Our experience is the best research out there is by a guy by the name of John Hattie, H-A-T-T-I. Uh, one of the problems we have in American education is we have too much research. Every graduate school professor in this country has done a research project. There, there are so much research, nobody can read all the research. And so what we started to do about 20 years ago is meta-analysis. How many have ever heard of meta-analysis? What is a meta-analysis? Overly simplistic. It's a research of the research. Between 2000 and 2012, there were over 800 meta-analysis reports done on K-12 education in this country. 800 meta-analysis reports. So many that you can't read them all. And so what Hattie did was a meta-analysis of the meta-analysis. And it kind of teased out the most important findings. And he began to see some things such as when kids learn how to apply knowledge, they do better in school. Make sense? Now, the higher the bar, the better it is. The higher the bar, the better it is. When kids learn how to apply knowledge, rather than just learning about knowledge, they have 1.3 years of growth per school year. By the way, if you don't use it, what's the flip side of it? If you do uh, learn how to use it, you retain it. So application knowledge is really important. Another one, uh, where there's a strong student-teacher relationship, kids do better. Where there's a strong student-teacher relationship, kids do better. You can see the amount of improvement. Literacy. Let me ask the audience, is reading important, yes or no? A little or a lot? <laughs> Let's see if you can complete the sentence. If you want to do a good job in teaching reading, you teach reading in the blank area. What word did I leave out? Content. Your state, your state data. What's the number one reason in Kentucky kids are failing the middle school and high school state math test? It's a reading problem. We know how to solve it. Who's got to teach reading? The math teacher. Are your middle school and math, high school math teachers teaching reading in the content area? Are they spending at least 15% of their time teaching reading in the content area? Or are many of them, as I was when I was a high school teacher, 
I thought you taught reading by giving a reading assignment. And when the kids didn't get it, I gave them more. What is your one, three, and five year professional development plan to teach every teacher how to be a teacher of reading in the content area? I will show you before we are done, you have a serious secondary school reading problem in Kentucky. Why? Because we don't teach it, except for the kids that need remediation. Literacy is king in these high performing schools. We found other, we also found that there are that, however, many of the things that work, you can't afford. Even with the great leadership that George and his staff had at Grec to create the Race to the Top grant, you can't afford in this region one-on-one -on -one instruction. You can't afford to put a computer in every child's hand. You would use every dollar you had. See, what we found is that in addition to what works, you gotta figure out what you can afford. And so, and what you can afford has to be after the grant, or it will not be sustained. And so, we use something called the Effective and Efficiency Framework to look at what worked. All things being equal, this is not a trick question. Which side of this chart do you want to be on? High cost or low cost? Where do you want to be, folks? Class, yell out. High, high or low cost? Low cost. Where do you want to be? Bottom of this chart or the top of this chart? Yell your answer out. What do you want? So what letter do you want to be in? What one do you want to avoid like the plague? A. Let me show you John Hattie's research. Now remember, I'm going to send, you're going to get my PowerPoint if you want it. I'm going to send you to a white papers that back up all the slides. This next set of slides is a whole white paper on it. Pick and choose what you want to share with your staff. Because when you begin to look, the higher the bar, the better it is. Here are the things that really had great impact. Teacher expectations with clarity. When teachers have high expectations, the probability is kids are going to do better. We have the bigotry of low expectations in too many of our schools. Number two, application knowledge. It doesn't cost a lot. That's the second column. And it's very effective. Literacy, very effective and doesn't cost a lot. There's a little professional development training for the teachers. Student-teacher relationships, really important. How do you do that one? How about looping teachers? How many of you loop, how, how many elementary administrators we have in the audience? How many of you loop most of your teachers? 25 most rapidly improving schools, nearly every elementary school looped all their teachers. We're the middle school, high school, building level administrators in the audience. 25 most rapidly improving middle schools, 25 most rapidly improving high schools. 50 schools in total in those two categories in the national study. 43 of the 50 are looping their eighth grade teachers into ninth. Whoa, doesn't he know they're different buildings? Exactly what I know. If the kids were the priorities, why would we ever take them out of smaller cloister environments and put them into a larger, more disconnected environment when they're physically and emotionally at that age going through changes in their own bodies they have no clue how to deal with? They're looping eighth grade teachers in the ninth. How do you get application of knowledge? Well, the real world application of knowledge doesn't occur one discipline at a time. Guess what we found in 47 of the 50 nation's most rapidly improving schools? And these schools do not know each other. They are not in a network together. 47 of the 50 eliminated department chair people. You know why? Ultimate gatekeepers to the past. What did they create instead? Chair people of interdisciplinary departments. They took a math teacher, a science teacher, a social studies teacher, art teacher, Put them in a team together. Give them a common planning period with the same group of kids all day long. And suddenly what is taught first period relates to second. See, we can go through all the mechanics of the common core, the teacher evaluation. But if it's still anchored in the old instructional organization of K-12 education, I'm here to tell you, 
our experience says it's not going to change student performance. 